Hello, welcome to today's session on working with Azure Databricks. And um, this will be a three part series. By the end of the series, you'll have the know how that it takes to create a geospatial forecast using uh, open weather data and some open traffic data. The uh, overall goal of the session is to get you, give you the ability to get hands on enough that you can participate in uh, an activity like an open hack or something like that, where you're really building something for real. And uh, with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to John from Databricks. And John, uh, go ahead and take it away. Hi, my name is John O'Dwyer. I'm the developer advocate uh, here at Databricks, and I'm uh, I'm joined by Nikhil Gupta, um, and who will introduce himself here in a little bit. Uh, myself and Nikhil. Uh, Nikhil is a uh, solutions architect at Databricks. Uh, we're here to uh, talk about um, essentially uh, how to get started. Uh, and we're how to get started with open data sets. Uh, we're, we're going to discuss uh, ingestion of data uh, from those data sets into Databricks and how to get started with uh, with weather data in particular. Uh, Nikhil is going to go through a, a demo of that and I'm going to show you a couple things ahead of time, but Nikhil is actually the one that's uh, going to uh, do do most of the work here. Nikhil, do you want to introduce, introduce yourself? Sure, sure. Thanks, John. Hi, this is uh, Nikhil Gupta, and I work as a partner solutions architect at Databricks, uh, working closely with Microsoft and GSA partners to enable customers and make them successful. Uh, I'm glad to be here and you know showcasing, showcasing some data ingestion to you. Thanks, Nikhil. And I'm going to pull up my screen here. Okay. Here we go. Can everybody see my screen? Okay, great. Um, first thing I wanted to show you was uh, just how to how to even get started with uh, Azure Databricks in in your Azure environment. So uh, Azure Databricks is a first party service in um, in Azure. Uh, you access it directly from your Azure uh, hub, and it's it can be set up and run immediately. So essentially, you just look for it. And you hit create, it'll take you through um, take you through the uh, the setup process. Uh, it uses uh, everything native in Azure, including uh, ADLS and uh, VMs for the compute. Um, everything else is essentially uh, those live in your environment, and there is a control plane that uh, that I'll show you here in a second as well. So that's that's all you do. You get started. You hit create. You get going. And when you uh, have finished, what you would end up on is this screen. Uh, this is a Azure Databricks workspace. Uh, the workspace is uh, all compute and data lives in your environment. And what we do is essentially uh, we give directives to data and also VMs to uh, to build clusters uh, to that you can then interface with through uh, through this website, uh, which is your your platform or workspace, and um, you get going and do all your work in this environment. A uh, couple things in here um, on this page, there are a lot of uh, tutorials and ways to get started. This is the main page of the of the workspace. Um, one thing that I wanted to point out is uh, the compute that's used at any given time. Um, the compute uh, that you uh, that that you use to actually do the work that you want to do in this case is ingest. Uh, you would you'd uh, pull up uh, a cluster and those clusters 
Uh, you can create a new one. You can easily give one a name. And uh, that's really all you need to do to actually start a cluster is give it a name. Uh, there are a couple things that I wanted to point out. There's a couple different modes that you can uh, that you can use. Usually you would actually start with standard. Uh, high concurrency is uh, is something that can be used in the case that you have a lot of people that you want to uh, bring on to the cluster uh, or in the opposite direction, if you want to do a small amount of work and really uh, just get starting with development, let's say uh, sampling ingest data or uh, just kind of noodling on a uh, on a ML project or ML model, you can use single node uh, instead. Um, there's also various different types of uh, runtime versions that you can use specifically around standard uh, for data engineering or ML for uh, ML specific pieces. Say if you, um, when you're ready to start modeling, if you wanted to use TensorFlow or sklearn or any of those, you can use the, uh, the runtime version for ML. Um, and that's about it. You can, you can then hit start and just start doing your work. Uh, one thing I did want to point out and is uh, we are we already have one up. Uh, this is Nikhil's cluster that's associated uh, to the work that he was doing. Uh, so I'm actually going to just go onto that and I'm going to show you how to um, go into the workspace and start doing some development. So uh, this is a uh, collaborative workspace where everybody can work together and you have your own little area uh, of the world that you can uh, that you can do your own do your own thing what i have is um, this is my workspace and uh, i have already started a dev radio uh, folder for the work that i'm doing and this is the notebook that i'll start with um, you can uh, you can pull up new notebooks uh, or or folders or even build out libraries that you need to use. Uh, building um, you can build ML flow experiments as well. To get started with a notebook, uh, if you don't have one, you can actually pick different languages to work in in Databricks. Um, I prefer Python, so that's actually what I uh, built my. Uh, notebook on but you can use Scala, SQL or R, uh, whatever languages are best for you and then you pick the cluster uh, that's up and running for you. Uh, in our case we're going to use Nikhil's already uh, up and running cluster. So um, what I um, what I have here, uh, I'm actually not going to do any of this work. I'm just going to yak on for a little while but uh, but what I did do and what we actually have for both the notebook that I'm going to show uh, and also the notebook that Nikhil is going to show later, we have a um, we have a Git repo of both of these notebooks uh, that are out there now uh, out in GitHub. Uh, there is a uh, notification of where to find them so you can actually uh, take them and follow along. Uh, this notebook, uh, these notebooks are a, um, it's a interactive and collaborative um, development experience. Um, this is, um, it, it makes developing uh, data engineering um, uh, workloads and also ML uh, type uh, work extremely easy. And uh, what you can do, which is really great, is uh, you can document your your uh, work with markdown so it's explicit. You can also then explain what you're doing and visualize it extremely well. For example, what I have here, everything in this notebook that I'm going to show is just that. It's just markdown. It's uh, it's it's uh, how you can visualize and convey your ideas to the outside world. Uh, the other nice thing is that Nikhil can actually be in here and we can pair a program um, together and he can actually uh, work in this notebook while I do. Um, 
this is a extremely powerful idea where you can actually collaborate together and do things together at the same time. Uh, and especially in days like now when we're not in the same place a lot of the times, uh, it, it makes it extremely productive to work and collaborate together and pair program uh, in these notebooks. Um, in here, I wanted to point out a couple things. So I'm using this notebook to essentially present how, uh, why you would use Databricks uh, and, um, and how it really uh, fits into the, uh, the architecture uh, of Azure as a whole. So um, what Databricks is generally used for are two things. Um, well, three, I guess, uh, analytics, um, machine learning, and also data engineering. Uh, in the core uh, is right here. Uh, Databricks uh, is the compute layer for big data and analytics and machine learning uh, of in Azure. And you can use all the different pieces of Azure uh, to uh, essentially in the ecosystem and uh, Databricks is one of those pieces. So for example, what we're going to show today is uh, how you can do ingest. Uh, that ingest can come from Event Hubs, uh, Azure Data Factory. It can also even come from, uh, from Azure Data Lake Storage. Um, and that's actually where we're going to pull our information from using two different uh, two different commands um, that we'll I'll point out in a bit and that Nikhil will actually go through a demo of how to do this. Um, with, um, with the data lake and Azure at the, uh, in, in the core of your analytics and data engineering, uh, you can also um, use various pieces. For example, you can push data to, uh, to Azure Synapse uh, for analysis and uh, very quick um, um, access to data. Uh, you can also um, access mach Azure Machine Learning and, uh, and also use Power BI as, uh, as your BI layer on top of the data that you uh, access through an Azure uh, Databricks cluster. We also um, uh, have have tools that you can use for uh, monitoring governance uh, that are in the Azure um, Azure um, ecosystem as well. Um, one thing that's at the core of how we do work at Databricks is something called Delta Lake uh, in the Delta Lake architecture. Uh, Delta Lake is a uh, is an open uh, data format that is based on Parquet, uh, but it allows you to do um, far more than just access data through Parquet. Um, it uses Parquet at its core, and essentially it's Parquet with a, uh, with a set of logs and indexes around the Parquet data. Uh, what makes da Delta Lake extremely powerful is that um, uh, a couple things. One is uh, the asset transactions uh, on a on a in a da data lake. Um, what I mean by that is um, at an atomic row level, uh, what Delta Lake allows you to do is um, is at a row level delete, update, merge data. It also uh, it also puts asset transactions around each of those so that uh, you can't get caught in between uh, in between transactions and corrupt your data uh, like you can with um, other big data technologies. Um, this is uh, an extremely powerful piece of uh, of of Delta Lake. Uh, it allows you to to do all these things such as asset uh, uh, such as delete data without um, without recourse in the case that uh, someone is reading the data at the same time you can you delete it you can't actually corrupt it in, that, in those cases it, it uh, keeps from that happening um, another thing that the log of uh, delta lake allows you to do is uh, you can actually start to use 
uh, these delta lake tables as sources or sinks of streams. And uh, you can start to uh, unify your ETL processes between streaming and, and batch. We'll actually get into some of that in a little bit and uh, different aspects of batch and streaming um, uh, with the ingest that Nikhil will show you later. Um, other, another very uh, great piece is schema enforcement. It essentially puts, a, puts guardrails around the type of data that uh, you are putting into your data lake so that it doesn't become a data swamp while also allowing you to uh, to evolve those schemas over time. Say if you need to change a data type in, in the schema that's associated to your delta table, you can do that. You can also uh, add extra rows, or excuse me, extra columns of data over the course of time as well. It's a very powerful tool on top of, uh, on top of your data lake. Um, Everything that's uh, associated here, you can also um, uh, reference. Uh, so if you go and get this notebook, there's a lot of different references that are directly in here um, around, around uh, what we see as the uh, data analytics uh, architecture and how, how Databricks fits in them. In that uh, ETL as a whole, uh, the uh, Delta Lake as a whole, uh, these two documents are actually what we'll discuss in a little bit with Nikhil around copy into. Uh, copy into is a, uh, an ingest type that is uh, a very easy way to do incremental ingest uh, through SQL. An autoloader is a very easy way that you can uh, do streaming ingest uh, uh, in the same manner. And um, to, to demonstrate this and also, you know, spur some ideas around uh, how you could take open data sets, we're, we're going to use uh, the Azure open data sets to access and ingest this information that Nikhil will go through uh, here in a minute. Uh, we are going to access those databases or data sets that you are already have ac access to through the open data sets. Uh, how to do that using uh, the Azure ML open data set package is what uh, Nikhil will actually uh, get into. Uh, this specific data set is a NOAA uh, weather data set that's available to, uh, to everyone. NOAA is a, um, is a um, uh, a, um, a NGO that's associated, uh, deals with atmospheric research here in America. Uh, and uh, we're just really uh, excited to see what you come up with from these packages. Uh, weather in particular has all kinds of practical applications. We've also um, referenced a couple use cases uh, that you can go check out uh, to associate uh, to weather to, to spur some uh, some thoughts around what a hackathon project you could you could build from these sets. Uh, one being uh, a really cool uh, case where actually uh, AccuWeather is using uh, using a lot of this data to literally predict the weather uh, on data. Databricks already and that uh, use case is associated here. So we're really looking forward to, to seeing what you come up with and, uh, and if, if and how these, uh, these, uh, these different um, features of Databricks uh, can help you out in doing so. So with that, I'm going to uh, turn this over to Nikhil and uh, this is the uh, notebook that he is actually going to get started with. So over to you, uh, Nikhil. I'm gonna... oh, perfect. Perfect, John. Thanks a lot. Uh, one question. Um, I think, uh, can you just elaborate a bit more around the, uh, the multi-hop architecture around the bronze, silver, gold? Like how do you, you know, go in and 
uh, what's the idea behind that right so just just a quick overview of the of the uh yeah oh of the uh of the essentially yeah the we call it the medallion um architecture uh this is a architecture that works extremely well in um in delta lake um that uh that architecture goes from an ingestion tables uh that we consider bronze uh those tables are actually what we will focus on today uh with copy into and um copy into an auto loader mm -hmm. those tables are uh are essentially just the raw format that that you have and using um using the streaming and iterative processes associated with the back of those tables you can actually use those tables as sources for other tables to uh to refine the data and transform it into silver uh silver sets of data where that's usually at a row level if you are looking to access data that's where you would actually do it you would be filtering out bad information dealing with duplicates uh and things like that past that you can um, then use uh you can take that information you can either um uh aggregate that data into gold tables or sometimes those gold tables that uh, that ML uh, ML uh, engineers would use are actually feature sets or uh, or models that are actually run on a row by row basis as well. So those gold tables are the ones that either data scientists or uh, or analysts would use uh that are really refined and are ready for consumption uh downstream is there anything else that, uh, yep yep perfect i think that's that's what it is it's end of the day right uh, think of it as like three you know just on a very high level think of these are three different folders on your adls location right and then you are just you know putting data in there like moving progressively towards more augmented and refined data sets that's definitely that's that's exactly right. Were there any other questions that you think that we should uh, that we should uh, go through at this point, or 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 do you think we should? Yeah, move? yeah, yeah. I think we are good. I think the another the last question is like you know how is how do we cost it? And you know I can you know quickly take that as well. So basically, you know, end of the day, uh, the cost is basically your compute so the uh, so the amount of time your cluster is up and running uh, you would be charged for that cluster running and that said you know we have a lot of like uh, uh, options in terms of you know auto scaling or you know uh, terminate after so if the cluster is ideal like for a certain amount of time it just goes and automatically terminates it so yeah so the compute end of the day is uh, is uh, um is charged uh, nothing else from database perspective perfect so let's go in and let me go and share my screen and uh, let's begin on the demo side sounds good thank you perfect yeah uh so hopefully my screen is you know uh, able to see my screen um so today you know the idea behind is uh, just to take uh, the noa data set uh, it's an open data set from azure perspective uh, take it from there uh, download some of the data and then you know uh, go in and move it to a delta location the cross location so this is the idea like you know most of the organizations or how would you see uh, you know getting data onto cloud right so you bring all sort of data your structured semi structured unstructured data the idea is to bring to a, a cloud cloud storage uh, adls gen 2 on azure is the best in class right you bring in that raw data and then once you have that raw data how do you how do you easily move it into your curated data form and you know uh, and we normally we recommend moving it to a delta lake uh, or a delta format and all the benefits with john talked about a bit earlier like asset transactions and caching and you know uh, all 
schema enforcement, uh, basically end of the day, Delta Lake gives you sort of data warehouse capabilities on your data lake, right? That's that's the idea. And once you are on your data is in curated format, uh, you can do all sorts of you know uh, workloads uh, on that data, right? So you don't have to duplicate data per se for different workloads, right? So same Delta Lake can be used to do streaming, to do your uh, analytics, uh, to do your machine learning workloads. So one data source and you can run your multiple workloads right uh, from from the same data. So that's that's the uh, that's the idea, you know, uh, for uh, for a unified data lake. Uh, and then just decomposing a bit more into that. And today we will be like concentrating on the Delta ingestion part of it. But you know, data could be coming from any number of sources, right? It could be a streaming source, it could be a batch source, getting from on-prem data sources, right? Uh, on Azure, if you are, you know, streaming it, probably you know, Event Hub or IoT hubs are the best way to get that data. Uh, and then, if you are like the batch processes, we have seen tremendous success with our customers using ADF, right? And then you move that data to a landing zone, and from there, you know, we start. Uh, to ingest it and bring it to bronze uh, layer, which is your raw ingestion layer. And today we will be more concentrating around auto loader and copy into command. So that's uh, that's you know uh, that's the idea. And then you know, we talked about the multi hop or the medallion architecture. And then you know Databricks provide with you with clusters, you know any of the language of your choice, optimize Spark to go in and process that data, you know, and use and develop different use cases around that data. So that's uh, that's the idea today, and uh, you know the the bunch of the demo we would be you know talking more about the auto loader and the copy into command. So that said, let's you know let's start and ingest some data, right? Uh, that's that's what we are here for. So um, um, as part of the you know uh, since we are using you know open data set, I just went in and did a pip install the Azure ML open data sets library, right? I did a pip install here. A uh, couple of ways you can you know put the library in. Uh, another way is if I go to my compute, right? This is my compute plat. This is my cluster, uh, Nick cluster, and I go into libraries. So I can go in and install a new library over here as well. I can then go in and I can say I can go to different repos like Maven, PyPy. Uh, I can even store libraries on my ADLS or DBFS, you know, or even just drop in some jar files, right? So good number of ways you can you know ingest those libraries and bring them to you on on your compute platform right uh, i do a, i take a simple approach i just do a pip install and i install this you know open data sets uh, library on top of it uh, once i do that uh, uh, then it becomes uh, real easy uh, i you know that my library is installed uh, i can go in and you know just import those libraries and you know few other things i need to process the data so we are doing you know in a way weather data so i just from the open data uh, open data set i just go in and import this library uh, for this demo uh, you know i'm working with bbfs which is databricks file system uh, which basically comes uh, you know automatically when you're deploying a databricks workspace uh, you could also use your ADLS gen to location or a blob storage. Uh, the idea behind for me to using DBFS was I want this notebook to be reproducible. So if you just go in and take this notebook and run in our environment, it would go in and run in it. So I, I took DBFS, but you know, these things you could even attach your uh, ADLS gen 2 or a blob storage location. You, you have to, you know, just bring it, mount it to your DBFS and you know, you can start putting data in and start you know consuming data from there uh, it's 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 it works in the similar fashion uh, so as a first step what i do is i just go and create a folder uh, i this is my dbfs in my dbfs i just created a folder called ingest started demo which is a folder i created and now once i have it i can go in and you know put some put some data in perfect so uh, now we are you know, ready to read data. A folder is already set. I've imported all the libraries, and now I can go in and you know uh, to take some data, right? So I for 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 the this demo, what I did was I just took ten days worth of data from May uh, May two thousand twenty. So I gave the end date and you know the start date. 
typically what i would suggest you know uh, don't put in like a lot of uh, like two or three years worth of data because uh sometimes you know the cluster uh, just try to you know handles probably a month at a time create some python function which would you know go in and automatically uh, read the data say a month at a time uh, so yeah that would be my suggestion like a tip uh, but you know uh, uh, to to just start getting that data in um so pretty easy to do that i take i take that data in uh, i you know uh, i read the data uh, from from 10 days worth of data and I convert it into a data frame uh, pandas and then go in and save into my CSV file. So now my CSV file uh, I've gone in and saved my CSV file uh, the data the 10 uh, the 10 days worth of data, right? So this is my CSV file where the data is in here. So think of it as now what we have done is we have moved the data to a landing zone, right? So this is where my data currently resides. Uh, and now the next step is I want to move it to my bronze zone, right? And then the two ways to do which we're going to discuss today is, you know, autoloader and copy into, right? So now data as a CSV file has landed in my landing zone and, you know, we'll go in and move it into the bronze zone. Perfect. So let's understand, you know, what, what are these two? Uh, what are these? Um, talk, we talked about autoloader and copy into and what are these two you know, exactly mean right so so th these two you know uh, are methods of ingesting your data uh, from uh, from a landing zone to a delta lake table or a folder right uh, the thing is like uh, somebody asked like what's what is like you no know, <laughs> how is it different and how is it useful so the idea is like you know with these two commands what happens and we'll show in the demo as well so let's assume you have a folder in ALS and you know constantly uh, you are uploading new data files to it, right? And once you run the autoloader or a copy into command, only the new files will get processed. So it's not the whole folder which will you know get processed. So let's assume I put in the data for me and tomorrow data set for June comes in. And once you run rerun your you know copy into or autoloader, uh, only the you know the June data would be picked up and processed and moved into a Delta folder. Now this is really really easy. Uh, this is really powerful for two things. One is you know you don't need some sort of a streaming architecture like Kafka, uh, you know, to get your data from from landing zone to your bronze table, right? So you don't it uh, it significantly uh, uh, simplify the incremental ETL process, right? So that's that's the idea and you can do both continuous ingest uh, and a schedule ingest. Uh, for scheduling, what we mean is, you know, you can put it as a job. So on data breaks, uh, if you want to schedule something, uh, we use something called jobs. So you can schedule it, say it's 9, 9 p.m. in the night, uh, run that notebook. It'll just go on, pick up the new files, uh, process them, and put it in your in in your branch folder, right? And then incrementally, your pipelines can run and move the data from silver to to the gold tables, right? Or you can have a more of a continuous process uh, in terms of, uh, for example, autoloader can work as more of an, a streaming uh, uh, streaming uh, use case where it goes on and continuously say listens to a folder and as soon as a file get drops in it goes in picks that file and you know moves it to your uh, to the branch folder so both can be done right you can do a scheduling you can do continuous you know and or copy into can work a copy and auto loader can you know do uh, both of these things so we talked a lot about it you know let's go and see in action how how things are working over here so as a first step, I do it. I just go in and create a database. So I create a database called ingest brown, right? So this is my database over here. Uh, I give it the location of the database as well, right? So and then uh, uh, there are no tables right now created on top of it. So you know it has no results. And this is how the copy into command works. So it's just practically one line of code, which basically you know, helps me move my data. So I do copy into. Uh, and I, you know, uh, this is my basically my my folder, uh, and which is you know uh, which I'm putting data into. This is my raw data or my landing data, right? Where the CSV file exists, 
uh, I mentioned that the reading the file I'm reading is a CSV file and you know I want the header to be true. So this is like with really a single line of code. I'm able to move my data which was in CSV format. Uh, this uh, this file Panda's 2020 file and I was able to convert into a data format, right? Uh, I, now I can see like around uh, there were around 3 million rows uh, and 3 million rows got inserted into that folder, right? Uh, let's go and look into the folder. If I go in, you know, uh, this is my uh, Delta folder, which basically end of the day Delta is, you know, the data is in part K and on top of part K we have something called a Delta log, which, you know, stores each each and every transaction that has been made on this folder, right? So really, really easy to do that, right? Uh, with single line of code, I'm able to you know convert this into a data format. Now I want to do some processing. I go in and create a table. So I went in, I created a table weather, uh, and I mentioned that the data is in delta format and the location of the data is this thing, right? So this is my folder, and I you know went in and start looking at the data, and now. It's a Python notebook. I just use a magic command percentage SQL and I start reading the data uh, select star from weather. So if you see right, it's it is really, really, you know, that simple. Uh, didn't have to, you know, do some Lambda architecture or something to you know, ingest the data into the branch. So that was around uh, copy into uh, command. Uh, the next uh, let's talk about autoloader, right? Uh, so autoloader, right? Uh, it's uh, it's the same thing. You know, we are using you know uh, an autoloader command uh, to basically go in and see if there is some data change. And you know, if there is a change, you know, it will go and process it, or it will probably send a notification as well, right? That the new file has appeared, right? So I do uh, similar things. Uh, this is my auto loader table, which I mentioned. This is a new location. Uh, I do a checkpointing. So checkpointing basically uh, now the auto loader knows where to start. Uh, you know, once uh, assume like you know something happens and auto loader just shuts down, and when you restart auto loader, it basically starts from the point where you know it it had stopped. So you don't have to reprocess the entire data or go in and go uh, you know start, restart your pipelines and you just start it from where you stop <clears throat> and i give my landing uh, uh, landing zone location where my csv file exists right and then uh, what i'm doing here is i just write this this is a auto loader sort of like uh, command so i i to i tell auto loader like this is you know a csv file this is my you know uh, checkpoint location uh, load the data from this the me.csv file you know from its here and then you know write the stream uh, in the delta format uh, trigger once is equal to true so trigger once true what does it mean is once you know uh, once the auto loader has read the file and processed the file the spark streaming will go and shut down so if so that's like really easy so imagine you, you know you put this in a, in an automated fashion on a job cluster so it'll just read the data and the stream will shut down. So if you don't put this, you know, the things will go on continuously. Uh, go, the stream will, you know, wait for new data to come in and the cluster would be up and running. And then, you know, I give the uh, auto loader checkpoint location and, you know, then I start it. So if I run this command end of the day, right, a, a streaming a stream would be created and uh, the data would be moved to my uh, to my new location. So I can go in and I can check, uh, you know, I read the data from the auto loader table and I can see I'm able to read the same data. Perfect, so that's powerful, you know, similar way I can go in and check my uh, data folder. Uh, it has a few parquet files to uh, actually and then there's a delta log to it. Uh, so I know the operation has been successful, uh, things worked out. Uh, so we are you know, now what happened is now we have like did a one iteration. I moved data which was in my landing zone and I moved it into into the bronze zone, right? So using both autoloader and copy into. And 
lastly, I just want to quickly go, you know, we talked about incremental ingest, right? We talked about it's how copy into an auto loader both uh, would be enable that incremental ingest. So you won't have to read the whole table again. It's only right. It's only uh, uh, the incremental table that would be uh, that would be ingested. So let's um, to showcase it. What I did was let I just you know read 10 days worth of data for June 2020, right? So I went to uh, I uh, did a similar operation, convert it into June, and you know this is a June CSV panda file. So now if I go in into my landing zone, there are two files in it, uh, one for June uh, 2020. Uh, another is for May 2020, right? The previous file. <clears throat> and I run the same command. I'm practically running the same command which I ran earlier. Uh, copy into uh, this location. Uh, this is the you know location for my uh, uh, for the the landing zone and give the file format and the file option, right? I, I practically ran the same command. Uh, and then what I see was the the number of rows which got inserted were around like 3 million, uh, 180,000 rows got inserted, um, which is like different from the previous one. So previously we had around 3,169 rows, uh, uh, 3 rows got inserted. And to check uh, what I did was I just did a select star from, you know, from, from my table and I found like total was 6 million. So now what happened was only the June process file got processed and now my total count is around six million rows, which got processed inside my inside my table. So that's how you know uh, uh, I was able to maintain the incremental ingest uh, with my copy into command. Uh, and then uh, a sim I did a similar operation with my auto loader, uh, and you know practically you can just put this in a in a notebook and run it as a job. I'll do the same thing. I just, you know, uh, ingested the uh, the files over here, uh, and because of auto checkpointing, the auto loader knows where to start from because you know it start from the last file it processed, and it start you know moving it, and I was able to you know ingest the data from here as well. So that was like you know a very quick demo. Uh, we showcased uh, two couple of things over here, and just you know uh, to process once what we showcased. Uh, we ingested data uh, from the open source NOA library, uh, which is like from the Azure ML open data sets, right? Uh, we created, uh, we ingested some data and put it as a CSV file in our landing zone, right? And then used Delta ingestion frameworks of our auto loader and copy into command. And then, you know, we moved the data into the bronze layer, which is the raw ingestion and history layer. Uh, so we moved in here. Uh, it's 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 good to go. Uh, and now you know uh, the idea is uh, we can you know use it for the silver, gold, and create our applications or create some you know machine learning models or BI applications uh, as you go and incrementally you know filter and clean and augment our data. Perfect. Uh, yep. Yeah, I think we have a question for John. Uh, yep. Is auto loader is the same as Spark streaming or any benefits? So um, that's a very good question. It, it's actually a type of way to ingest data using stru Spark streaming. Um, what I mean by that is um, it it is another way to do it in the same way that you can use Kafka. To, uh, to ingest data using Spark Streaming. Uh, the really, uh, the, there are a couple very profound reasons to use it as opposed to something like Kafka, uh, being that you don't have to include like another technology and moving part. You can actually use uh, Azure Data Lake as your essentially your streaming source as opposed to using something uh, like Kafka. There, there are other reasons as well, um, because uh, uh, we actually use schema inference associated to, uh, to auto loader. So that makes it extremely convenient and easy, as you can see from what Nikhil did. 
uh, where he didn't give it a schema that was associated to the uh, to the stream. He actually used it directly without without uh, doing that. Uh, it also allows for um, for schema evolution of those schemas over the course of time as well, which are both of those are pretty powerful along with uh, other various uh, pieces such as being able to interactive, uh, being able to use CSV, um, JSON, and then also give hints to what those, uh, what those schemas are as well. Any other questions, Nikhil? Um, perfect, not, not that I can see, I'm just trying to see. Uh, if there's any other question which you know the whole audience would benefit, uh, that's for now. I'm just in the published one as well. Uh, yeah, that's all for now. Yeah, feel free to you know ask your questions. Right, it's a it's open forum. Uh, the more interactive you make, you know, it's it benefits the whole audience as well. So yeah, keep 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 the questions coming in, and we'll we'll answer as we go. And then one thing around autoloader uh, as well, it doesn't necessarily only have to uh, be 24 seven streaming. So uh, one of the pieces, if you would go down on your uh, uh, on your screen, Nikhil, to the trigger once piece that's associated. Um, so autoloader allows you to stream it, uh, but uh, what you can do is you can actually go between uh, streaming and use it as a batch instead using this statement right here in line seven called trigger once. Uh, that's a very powerful idea as well because you don't always have to use streaming technologies. You, uh, a lot of the times just the other features are good enough and something that are really great to use. For example, the fact that you can incrementally move data, as Nikhil showed, without re-duplicating uh, the data from May if you're in June. Uh, the others being the features that I pointed out around, um, around the schemas, the evolution of the schema, and, uh, and various hints that you can give to the type of data coming through as well. Um, one other thing that you might want to point out, um, and I, Nick, Nikhil actually hit on this as well, is that if you don't want to do that, you can uh, you can also use copy into, which is a batch uh, a batch technology, uh, and that's the generally the main the main difference between the two. Perfect. Um, yeah, I think let me check on the questions. I think we're good on the questions. Uh, still nothing much. Uh, perfect. I'm just trying to answer a few, but yeah. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, so. Uh, so as you know, first step, I would like uh, as John and you know, we mentioned the, the notebook is on GitHub repository. Uh, you can go and download the notebook at your end. Uh, go in and you know try to ingest some data in uh, Azure has a lot of like open data sets. Uh, NOA is one of them, so just go in, download some data, try to play with it, uh, and see you know uh, how we can do it. Uh, this demo we use, you know, we put everything on DBFS. Uh, ideally, like we don't recommend putting data on DBFS uh, if you are you know you, like if you're working on a production sort of environment. Uh, but this this notebook is meant to be you know run on any environment so you can do it uh you can use you know adls gen to you know put put your landing zone here and here both can be on adls gen to or a blob storage uh, and it would work perfectly fine you just need to go in and mount those uh, uh, containers onto onto dbfs and you know you should be good to go for from there uh, and there is documentation around how how you would go in and mount those you know your containers onto DBFS or even go and directly access the data from from these containers, right? So there's there's documentation available uh, there as well. Um, and you know go in uh, get some data in and really powerful like copy into an auto loader, right? Uh, a lot of customers use it, move data from you know one uh, one folder to another. Move it from Delta, move it you know into Delta format, and you know good to go from there. And yeah. 
Yeah, we have. I think we have a bunch of questions as well. Let me go and check it. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so I think one question is around you know for processing streaming data through auto loader, should cluster be up and running for twenty four hours? Uh, no. no. Yeah. yeah. You don't have to. Uh, that's the beauty of uh, of trigger once is that you can. What what it does specifically is it will actually take and finish what is what is existing at any given time and then turn itself off when it's done. Uh, it's a very powerful feature that makes sure that you don't have to keep things up for 24 hours, 24-7. Uh, nice. Um, I think one more question which we can take is uh, another question uh, which comes up is uh, so let's assume right you have data which is how do we go and incrementally process data for a middle architecture right so you get all the data in the bronze layer you got a file from june in the bronze and now you want to process it to the silver layer right uh, can we like how do we go and incrementally go and process that data uh, that's actually a very good question. Uh, there is uh, something called uh, change data feed that allows you to take uh, take the data that is going into the delta table and off the back of that table, you uh, you then can process that information on a row by row level, whether it actually is inserted or updated or deleted even. So you can you can essentially take action on, on any of the values that are associated uh, based off of change data feed. It's also CDF is what um, is what we call it as well. It's it's a CDC technology for delta tables specifically. So that's that's a great question. It uh, it essentially rounds out the ability to really do that medallion architecture fully fully all the way through and with CDF and also with uh, with uh, autoloader, you can do all of this in a streaming and continuous manner if you want to as well. Perfect, thanks a lot, John. Another question is like, does autoloader work only with Databricks and Delta Lake? Uh, can autoload you know, data from other sources and ingest data into a database? Uh, you can, it it works uh, so let me uh, let me break that into two questions actually yeah <laughs> so the first question can you take it from different sources uh, you you can use uh, it, it's it's made to you can take it from different sources as long as those sources are associated to an object store uh, storage uh, source excuse me and it is uh, of types such as text uh, csv and json so it has various formats that are uh, available uh, to access but it is using an object storage uh, object storage to do so um, the other question it is actually uh, specific to databricks and delta it is an ingestion tool for delta tables Perfect. Uh, one question is around, you know, uh, how to create a job and I'll go and quickly showcase how we can go and create a job uh, from, you know, for, for this notebook. So uh, hopefully my screen is still visible. If I go, yep. so if you go uh, on the left hand side, right, uh, there are a couple of uh, icons and one of the icons is jobs. So I go in and I click jobs over here, right? So I go in, I click jobs. And there's something called a create job, right? So I now I can go in and create a job from this. So I say, okay, test one, two, three. Uh, the next thing is I can say what my job needs to run. You know, we have a couple of options. I can run a notebook, a jar file, right? So I select a notebook and I can go in and select a notebook from here. Uh, hopefully, I just let me so sure. So I just select some random notebook for now. So I can go in and you know uh, run this, uh, select the notebook, and then I can give the cluster configuration, right? So I can say, okay, this is my cluster configuration, uh, which I want to you know go and run on it, right? 
So I can uh, I can go in and you know uh, give the cluster configuration and I can go in and create a notebook out of it. I uh, create a job out of it, right? So what happens is that that particular time uh, point of time, uh, the cluster of this configuration would come up. Uh, it will run this notebook and you know it would uh, die down. So so if you have to say a trigger into it, like copy into or a trigger once only thing. It'll be just uh, the cluster would come up, uh, run the particular notebook, and uh, go in and you know uh, send the results. Uh, another way to create it, uh, which is like a little bit more uh, you know simpler. This was like this was uh, my. I'll, I'll go to my notebook once again. Okay. So this was uh, this was the notebook, right? And I, if you see over here, I can go and schedule it as one. So I can schedule a notebook. I can say schedule my job and I can give it say every uh, every day. I want to run this notebook and uh, confirm it, right? So yeah, so you can do either ways. So basically, you know, I'm just went in and created a job which is supposed to run on a schedule. Perfect. Uh, yeah. Um, what else? Uh, so we showcase the job thing. OK. I'm happy to answer them since I can't see him, Nikhil. <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, um, does it uh, does you know do we integrate with Azure ML Studio? Uh, yeah, from from yeah, from ML perspective, yeah. If you you can go and do all create all your models, right? Uh, but definitely uh, you can go in and you know we definitely integrate a lot natively with Azure ML. So you know you can move models from one environment to another uh, if you want to do it. If you, uh, ideally if you want to serve your models out, you can move to Azure ML and then use you know uh, AKS or uh, Kubernetes, uh, Azure Kubernetes services or uh, those solutions to serve your model out. Yeah, definitely that integration exists. Uh, to be honest, like we integrate almost natively with uh, all Azure services around, right? ADLS, ADF, Synapse, AML, right? All these services, uh, there's a deep integration that has been built in. Uh, which uh, provides a seamless experience, sort of a seamless experience to the customers to, to work with. OK, uh, a question for you, like would you use Databricks job over running ADF at, you know, ADF pipeline? Uh, uh, that's a yeah, that's go that's ahead. A, that's a great question. Actually, they integrate with each other, so Essentially, uh, what you can do is you can um, you can call from ADF uh, in a notebook that would then uh, hand off, say, an ingestion data into uh, into a notebook and run uh, run that as a job. That's essentially the normal path that we actually see. I don't know. Do you have anything to um, add there? But that's that's a it's more of an integration yeah. of to like using one over yeah. the other. Yeah, it's mostly like you know, it's uh, it's 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 sort of a preference. Like you can you can definitely stitch in different notebooks and try to create a pipeline. Uh, but if you want to just orchestrate your pipeline, right, in a way that is much more visible, much more you know GUI based uh, thing, uh, you would go in and use you know uh, ADF and create a pipeline out of it. A lot of our customers like use those features uh, because. You can just orchestrate your pipelines and you know everything runs on data breaks uh, for that. You know, take those uh, benefit of those powerful clusters and uh, spark, right? So definitely, you know, you can, can do it. It's just a preference. How do you want to, you know, uh, orchestrate your pipelines over there? OK, um, we have time for a few more. So how do you like how difficult it is to add a column on Delta, Delta Lake uh, when the schema changes? It's seamless actually. Uh, so uh, there is a setting on a uh, Delta Lake table that allows you to uh, to evolve the schema over time and uh, when it sees new uh, new columns, it simply adds it and that's how it works. It's uh, pretty pretty easy and seamless. 
uh, and it's just a property that's associated to that table uh, on a table by table basis. Yep, yep, it's it's really easy to do that. Like by default, we enforce schema, but you know we understand you know schema changes, uh, schema evolves over time. So the, that setting is like really one single setting which you do it, and you can add columns to your delta lake. Perfect. I'm just trying to see. Great job. Um, I think we have one final question is, you know, I have two tables in silver layer. Uh, I make an inner join between them uh, when there is new data. What is the best strategy to load the data into the gold layer? Uh, so uh, that would actually be how you do it, quite frankly. Um, there it uh, I'll actually there's a second caveat to that that I'll mention in a second, but uh, but essentially what you do is you literally interjoin those two tables and then the product of those tables would be your uh, would be your gold table. You can actually do that for silver tables as well, uh, where the silver table, you know, might have only an ID for for like sales orders. Uh, you would uh, link to a, a another table that tells you, you know, who that what the IDs associated to it for like say a company or something like that. Um, so you would interjoin them together and then you would take the product of that and, and ingest that data, whether that being using uh, CDF uh, for like an iterative uh, streaming case or, uh, or using uh, in a batch case, you can do that uh, using the full table to then uh, to fulfill the the gold table, um, those cases would be uh, the place where a uh, full batch uh, overwrite would make sense. Is essentially when you have extremely complex uh, aggregations that actually need to make a new, like almost make a new table over the over the course of what's uh, what's already there. Uh, that actually that whole idea as well is easily done in Delta because of the acid transactions, you can actually do an overwrite and still access the, the table as is until that overwrite is finished. Perfect. I think we are done with the questions over here. I see no more questions. Um, uh, um, Yep. Um, anything else from your end? Final remarks, John? No, I would just say excited to see what what ideas this spurred, whether that be around uh, the features that we showed with uh, with copy into and auto loader, or if if the uh, if if thinking through uh, the weather data helped. Uh, do that, or if the identification of the of the set as a whole is is where uh, you gain your your inspiration from. Uh, it would be great to see what comes of it, and we will have two other sessions like this where uh, you can kind of noodle on your on your thoughts uh, as as we're going through these new features that will help uh, hopefully. Uh, spur on a lot of great ideas. Yep, perfect. Yeah, uh, yeah. My experience, right, has been like you know, data ingestion. Usually, sometimes uh, uh, it becomes difficult, and that's why you know we introduce this copy into and in you know, auto loader to make that data ingestion a seamless process. And yeah, looking forward to uh, to the next sessions from our end, and happy to you know see what 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 comes out of it of the hackathon. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you both so much. This was uh, great today. Folks, if you want to follow up with us after the session, feel free to send mail to msusdev at microsoft.com. And I uh, hope to see you on uh, in our next session in about a month. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Matt.